Turn with me in, to, in your Bible. So Romans chapter 12, we're finishing our relational health series this morning, and we're talking about creating a healthy community, creating a healthy community. And uh, this week has been challenging in the United States. It's been challenging in the world. So many things to pray about this week. We've, our hearts have been broken uh, for the situation going on in Afghanistan. I know I have some per, uh, close personal friends who've been uh, missionaries there for years. They had to be evacuated, and obviously our hearts are with many people that are being pulled out of there. Our hearts are with the Christians in Afghanistan as they're coming under. So we're praying for that. The uh, fatality count in Haiti has been much higher than we expected, and so that's burdening our heart. In the East Coast, the the, um, the tropical storm that's coming in. And on top of that, for us here in San Diego, um, our one of our staff members, Jeanette, has been, is, is it really loud? Like, I've, it's so hot up here, uh, not hot, but loud. Uh, if we could just take it down just a little, thank you so much. In the back, we're just trying to, we just reconfigured the whole tent, put new speakers in, so we've all, always got to work out these kinks. So, And let's give a hand to the guys in the sound booth. They have... A sound booth is kind of like a center on a football team. Like, no one comes up and says, like, great snap the whole game, but the one snap that goes over your head, everyone gets on them. So I feel that strongly for the centers of this world. Not to be confused with the centers of this world. Um, we've been praying for Jeanette Cowan, one of our staff members. She's hospitalized for COVID, so appreciate you keeping her in your prayers. One of my closest uh, pastor friends, Ed Noble, uh, who pastors Journey, has been in ICU with COVID this week, and we've been contending for him. Uh, I think you know uh, Miles McPherson's wife, Debbie McPherson, has been uh, hospitalized. So just there's so many, um, so many things to keep us prayerful, and that's what we want to do as the body of Christ. What do you do when you get bad news? We go to prayer. We don't go into despair. We go into Prayer. The second thing you do, which I so appreciate our worship team doing, is we come and enter the presence of God. So I, I just want to continue to bring these things before us because we continually get bad news. We continually see the world shaking, but we have a stable God in the midst of the pain of this world. And our place of standing is prayer. Our place of standing is in the presence of God through worshiping wholeheartedly. But our other place is through the stable community that can only happen through the people of God called the church. And the church is God's plan for, for bringing hope and life and transformation to the world. And so as we've been talking this summer about relational health, the church has the answer to create a relationally healthy people. I don't know if you've noticed as you look around the world, relational health is, is a dying commodity. And we believe that God wants to bring a revival of relational health. And so we find this in, in Romans chapter 12, verse 1. It says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. You see that? Don't conform to the pattern of this world. The world is in a landslide towards depravity. And the Apostle Paul, the writer of the book of Romans, is saying, don't conform to it, but be transformed. Be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, and his pleasing, and his perfect will. You have two choices on earth. It's either to be conformed to the pattern of this world, or to be transformed into the image of Jesus. Like, do you realize that? As you live, there's no neutral ground. You're going to either be conformed to the pattern of this world or you're going to be transformed into the likeness of Jesus. And that's what he desires for you. You see, we're all disciples of someone. We're all being conformed. As you live, day by day, you are being conformed into the image of something. And most of us, we are taking our cues from the world. I mean, I, this was... This is normal in human nature. I remember the first person I tried to conform to was this guy, Michael Jackson. Michael Jackson, uh, this is his thriller jacket, 
And I, I went as a kid, and I was enamored by Michael Jackson. I got the poster, I put it over my bed, and I would study him. And I saved up my money, and I went out and bought the red jacket. I, this is what I looked like. Uh, I, I literally walked around with the red jacket, the, the, the white sequin glove, the hat. I learned to move like I would moonwalk around my house. Right? I loved wood floors that you could slide across. I, did, I tried to do that in dances. Um, I'd, I'd, you know, I'd sing <laughs> these high little... We're all conforming into someone. We're taking our cues and conforming. It's, it's natural in human nature. Babies do that, right? That's why parents do this smile, and then they, they do this, and then the kids mimic it. Like it's, it is innate in human nature to, to behold and become, to behold and become. That's what we do. I was cracking up that, that uh, my, uh, one of my boys had his first football game and, and, or his first football scrimmage, and he said, the refs aren't going to be there, so we've worked up our victory celebrations. And he goes, so we're going to get in the end zone and all do the rowing thing in a boat. And I'm like, no, you're not. No, be humble. Don't do that. But he's seen, they've seen that in professional football. So they are, they are beholding on professional football, these athletes getting in the end zone, doing these choreographed dances. So they were going to do that. And, and, and we're, that is just so how we are as humans is to behold and become. So that's why the Apostle Paul is giving this, uh, this understanding of the type of community as the church that we are to be. It says this, for by the grace given me, I say to every one of you, do not think of yourself more highly than you ought, but rather think of yourself with sober judgment in accordance with the faith that God has distributed to each of you. I'm gonna give you some, some keys for a transformational community today, some keys for creating a healthy community, but what I wanna say from the outset is this, it's all based on grace. It all comes from the grace of God. It's not about taking notes of this and going, okay, I'm just gonna be strong enough, I'm gonna muster up my strength, I'm gonna go out and be perfect. No, that's impossible. We have to have the grace of God. If, if you're new to Christianity, or maybe you, you haven't done a study on this before, let me give you a grace defined. Here's what grace is. It's the generous, free, and totally unexpected and undeserved favor, love, forgiveness, and a share in the divine life of God. Some of you need to take a picture of that and meditate on that this week. It's the generous, free, and totally unexpected and undeserved favor and love and forgiveness and share in the life of God. Here's why the church, when it's operating as it's called to, is, is the most amazing community going on in the whole earth. It's because it's infused with undeserved favor. It's empowered by supernatural love. There's actually forgiveness flowing. And there's a share in the divine life of God. When we come together, it's not just people doing a religious meeting. This isn't just like the Kiwanis Club or the Rotary Club, and I'm not denigrating that. I, I love community. I love community happening. But when we come together, we're sharing in the divine life of the living God. The life of the living God is flowing within us. <clears throat> I love this phrase, don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. Don't think of yourself more highly than you ought. We're, we're a self-absorbed culture. We're always thinking about what I can get. We're always, we're always thinking about how are people treating me. And Paul is explaining, no, when we come in, we operate in grace. We need to extend grace. We receive grace from God. Like if you don't receive grace from God, you can't give grace to other people. If you don't receive grace from God, you can't give it to other people. And so we're coming in, we want to be an other-focused people. He says, for just as each of us has one body with many members, and these members do not all have the same function, so in Christ we, though many, form one body, and each member belongs to all the others. 
We have different gifts according to the grace given to each of us. If your gift is prophesying, then prophesy in accordance with your faith. If it's serving, then serve. If it's teaching, then teach. If it's to encourage, then give encouragement. If it's giving, then give generously. If it's to lead, do it gently. I do it, do it diligently. If it's to show mercy, do it cheerfully. So today, we're not going to go through each of these gifts. What I want to highlight is that word give. I want to highlight that word give. The difference between the church community and other groups is when you come together as the church, a healthy church is one where each member is coming to give, where each member is coming to give. I was sent this article about this 92-year-old woman who is known for her happiness. 92-year-old woman, she is known for her happiness, so she interviewed her. I thought, that's a great person to interview. If you're still happy at 92 years old, I'm going to listen to you. You know what two of her main points were? Give more, expect less. Give more, expect less. I hear people all the time, you know, uh, saying, I, I, no, one, no one called me. No one, no one contacted me. No one served me. No one invited me. And this 92-year-old woman's voice echoing in her heads, give more, expect less. Give more, expect less. It's amazing how when you give, God gives back to you. You know, here's what's human nature. It's, it's human nature for us to come into a big group of people, to come into a room or to come into a, a Sunday morning and just you're, you're thinking, who, who's going to accept me? Who is going to, who's going to talk to me? Who is going to meet my needs? And God is saying, no, church, give and it will be given to you. Give and it'll be given to you. I just had this experience. I was going to a, a big conference back in Texas, and you know, there's a, a lot of people I don't know now. And I, I used to have this this role, like kind of this this prominent role, and uh, and I, I transitioned out of that. And so I'm going, and I'm just saying, like, okay, Lord, what do I do? And I felt like God told me two people. You're really trying to serve these two people. So I went in, going, okay. I'm not going to I'm not going to let my insecurity. I'm not going to let, you know, who who am I sitting with? Who am I having lunch with? I'm just going to focus on giving. It's so interesting. I I I did that and and in the midst of that, I'm sitting kind of just in the back in this in, in this obscure place and and wouldn't you know, someone just out out of the crowd just comes up and says, "God just highlighted you and I felt like I was supposed to pray for you." And they just gave me and I was just crying with this word. But you know, when we give, God is gracious to give back. It says, give, and it will be given to you, pressed down, shaken together, and overflowing. We need as the church, we go in, our mentality is to give. Our mentality is, I'm bringing my gift. I'm bringing, I'm bringing my contribution, and God's going to take care of us. We need a, a heart to give. Then he goes on to say this, love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. I love funerals. I actually love, I, and let me say it this way, I love funerals of Christians. Uh, it's, it's hard when you have a funeral of someone who doesn't, didn't know Jesus, right? When, when someone knew Jesus and they've lived their life for him, it's a celebration of life. It's a celebration of life. And, and here's what I find. When we get to a funeral of someone who lived their life well, I actually haven't been to a funeral where someone just goes on and on about what a great career they had. I haven't, I haven't actually seen that. I haven't heard a, a funeral where someone just goes on and on about what, how incredible they were in their extracurricular activity, what a great athlete. You know the, the one thing that people speak about is how they loved I mean, that is the one thing that funerals have in, in common. And man, when you're in one of those, we, we just had one of these in the tent about six weeks ago. You are overwhelmed with what's most important in life. That is what people get up and speak about. I don't know if you've been in a funeral where, uh, where enough people can't talk. You know, they just, they just keep getting up. It's always about love. It is always about love. Healthy community is based on love. And, and that is what we need more in this day and era than anything. Right? We're, we're in a day and era where people, it's hate. It's tear apart. It's destroy. 
It's this group against that group. It's this political group against this group. It's tearing down. It's pointing out. And Paul's saying love must be sincere. Hate what is evil. Cling to what is good. So I want to talk to you for a few moments today about our relational DNA. Our relational DNA as a church. We had this experience when we launched All People's Church years ago in our house. So we, this church launched in, in our little living room right by the, the college area. And I remember a wise older guy coming in, and, and he was hearing the stories of what had happened. It, we, we had an amazing time. People would come in to, to our living room, and they'd, and they'd just say, well, I, when I'm here, I feel the peace of God. I feel the presence of God. People that, that didn't know Jesus, people that were Christians, they'd come in and just go, like, I feel God's presence. And, and other people would say, man, it's so, it's, it's so awesome to just watch your marriage or your, your family and how you love each other. And, and, and they just stay, and, and we just linger around our, our dining room table. I mean, it's why we do small groups, because people are desperate for a, a place of peace. They're desperate to see healthy relationship. And this older man wisely said, he, he said, so how is your church going to understand how they're expected to treat each other? And um, Steph and I naively said, well, I, I guess they're going to be around us, our, our little our, our, our little team, we, had, we moved here with a team, a few couples, and, and they're going to get that. And he goes, so, where, you know, where did you get these values? And I said, well, I, I guess we, we got them from our, our, our parents and our spiritual parents. We, Steph and I are super blessed to come from, from Christian parents that loved each other, loved Jesus. We had incredible mentors. Steph lived with, with uh, our, our pastors of our, our church in Texas that we came from. I, I was always in their home. And so we picked up these values. And he said, yeah, that's, you know, people are feeling that. But this church is going to move out of your living room. And you're going to get to a point where everyone can't just be in one home. And so you actually have to codify these values. You have to actually write them down. And that's why Paul was writing these down in Romans 12. Because he knew, hey, I can't be with you forever. I, and you're not going to just be able to be around me and, and, and experience this. So let me write down. Let me write down these values, this relational DNA that the church is supposed to have. And so he's going to unpack these. He says this: Be devoted to one another in love. Honor one another above yourselves. Never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Be joyful in hope, patient in affliction, faithful in prayer. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice. Mourn with those who mourn. Live in harmony with one another. Do not be proud, but be willing to associate with people of low position. Do not be conceited. Do not repay anyone evil for evil. Be careful to do what is right in the eyes of everyone. If it's possible, as far as it depends on you, live at peace with everyone. Let me just pause for a second to say, I love the word of God. Don't you? I mean, what, we're so blessed to be able to have the word of God. I just love reading the word of God in church. And just go, these words are true. Now, this is just total side note. But, you know, I, I look at the news. I, I look at the news every day. But, you know, as you look at the news, you wonder, is this true? Or who's spinning this? Or am I really hearing? Can I tell you, every time you open this book, you're getting the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth. The word of God is true, and we have the privilege of savoring it, of building our lives upon this. So in Romans 12, we get this relational DNA. There's several, some things to do, but there's also ways to treat each other. So I want to I take out the ways to treat each other that the Apostle Paul is giving us, and this is what we base our relational DNA on. So we, we call them here the five H's. If you were with us in the spring or if you've been with all peoples for any amount of time, you've heard of the five Ds, right? The five Ds are the growth path that we see in the Apostle Paul's life of how he's transformed. We're a church of transformation, and so there's this growth path, decision, dunked, delivered, discipled, deployed. But we've also had this internal way in Scripture that Paul teaches us how to treat each other. And so this is what he's unpacking in Romans 12. I want to put these up for you. 
Here they are, the relational DNA that we see in Romans 12. Honor, hard work, honest and vulnerable, hospitable and warm, healthy conflict. We see these. I want to unpack these for you in Scripture because this is going to create a healthy community. Most of us didn't grow up in healthy families. If you just watch TV, I mean, the, the understanding you get of community, it's so unhealthy, it's so dysfunctional. And if that's what we see, if we're watching TV, if we're just modeling, like I did, off Michael Jackson, or you're modeling after, after the, your latest favorite show or your latest Instagram influencer, you're probably not getting this. So let's look at what Paul, the Apostle Paul, is talking about, because he, here's the thing. Um, These are the rules of how we're going to engage. And all of a sudden, some of you are like, "Uh uh-uh, don't give me rules. Like, I'm free. Yeah, I want to be free, right? No, I I want to tell you, you love rules. And and I love rules, and I'm not not like a big rule guy. I mean, you can ask my team. Like, I'm not like, I'm not, you know, I'm not the like, let's do this. You know, I'm an artist. I'm like, ah, let me express myself, right? If I wasn't balding, I'd have long, flowy, free hair. Like, seriously, in heaven, I'll have long hair. Um, look at my boys. You can tell. I live through them. Um, so, so don't be like, oh, Robert's this religious nitpicky. No, 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 no. But I do love rules. Like, I love the rule that you have to stop at a red light. Well, let me say this. I love that you have to stop. At a re- <laughs> uh, why? Because I like being able to drive through an intersection and not get hit. I love the rule that you drive on the road and you walk on a sidewalk. I love that people can't drive on sidewalks, right? That, there, I, love, I love those rules. I love the rules that someone can't just come up and pull my wallet out of my pocket. Right? I, there are rule, why do we have rules? We have rules to protect, to keep people safe. To, to give us peace of mind. And that is why Paul is giving these, these, these rules of how to live with each other. And, and the first one is this, honor. Honor. Oh, my gosh, don't you wish the world operated by this rule of honor? Oh, my gosh. There is so much dishonor, right? The second anyone says anybody, we jump all over them. It makes life very painful. The Scripture says this, honor one another above yourselves. Here's what I know about you. You love to be honored. You, you love for people not to tear into you. You love for people not to gossip about you. You love for people to actually be gracious to you. It's amazing the, the culture we're living in. It's amazing the backbiting, the gossip, the, the defamation of people. Guys, in the, in the church, we're to be a culture of honor. Listen to what the church is, 1 Peter 2.9. I pray this over myself all the time, just to remind myself of who I am. But you are a chosen people. Say chosen. You're a chosen people. A royal priesthood. Say royal. You're royal. A holy nation. Say holy. Say I am holy. Oh, that's good. God's special possession. Say special. You are special that you may declare the praises of him who called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. When you turn and look down the row, you are looking at royal people. You're looking at holy people. You're looking at chosen people. You're looking at special people. Every person called by the name of Jesus is holy, special, chosen, called out, royal, and they deserve to be honored. When someone comes into this place, they will be honored. That is one of our rules. If you have not been honored by us, we actually repent. And that is not our heart. Our heart is for you to be honored. We need to honor. We need to honor people. We need to honor. We need to honor women in this church. We need to honor men in this church. We need to honor children. I love that Jesus gave honor to children. I love that Jesus gave honor to the poor. I love that Jesus honors each and every ethnicity and people group. I love that Jesus honors people. We need to honor leaders. We need to be a culture of honor. And when you come into a culture of honor, there is a peace and there is a joy. 
that comes with that. Let's, let's be a people who practice honor. How do we honor people? We say hi to people. We actually look at people. I don't know if you've ever been to a place where no one even, even looked at you when you came in. No one recognized you. That is not fun. Right? I remember one, one pastor saying, you know, in our church, we want to give people anonymity. We want people to be able to slip in and slip out, you know, and no one notice that they're there so people can kind of hide out. And I'm like, that's not the kind of family I want to grow up in. I, 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 I love being in, in a place. I love when you walk in a room. Have you ever walked in a room and no one says anything, like, and the conversation just keeps going, versus you walk in the room and, oh, oh this is so great. This is so great. I'm just thinking about this stuff from last night. Uh, we went to a lot of sports games this week, but last night, this, the, this fourth string kid um, got in and made a play on the sports field, and his friends went crazy. Okay. They were like, LD, LD. And his name was 32. They were like, 32, we love you, 32. They're going crazy. Like they couldn't stop going crazy. And you start seeing this guy smile. He got one tackle. All of a sudden, you turn around and his friends, these two guys, have taken off their shirts and written LD on their stomachs. Okay, and so they're 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 yelling for him. By the it, this is so awesome. So our team goes up. And this is, the, this is either the fourth or fifth string running back. They put him in in the, last, the second to last play of a game, and he's so excited because his friends, have, his friends went crazy. I mean, it was like overboard how, how much his friends went crazy. Over the, so the coaches here, the, the kids, and so they're like, you know what, we're just going to bless these kids. And they put him in on the second to last play of the game, and he's so pumped up, he goes and knocks down the other guy and recovers a fumble on the one-yard line. And so now the crowd is going crazy. 32, we love you. I mean, they're, they are going crazy. And so then they're like, give him the ball, give him the ball. So they put him in, the fifth string running back, to run in. And he runs in and gets a touchdown. It's like the best day of his life. And so the crowd's going crazy. They dogpile him. At the end. But I'm like, that is honor. This guy, he gets one play. His friends go so crazy. They paint his, not his name on their chest. And what happens? He does something that no one ever dreamed he'd do. That's the power of honor. Right? That is the power of honor. We want, we want let's, let's make people great in this church. Let's give people a chance that no one else has given people a chance. Right? 32, we love you. Hard work, Romans 12, 11, never be lacking in zeal, but keep your spiritual fervor serving the Lord. Keep your spiritual favor serving the Lord. You know, you'll, you'll never be completely fulfilled until you are working. You're serving the Lord. One of the things that concerns me is I, I, I'll hear people say, oh man, um, I, I, I got the best job. I only have to work three hours a week, and then I can just do whatever I want. Did, did you know that work is not a product of the fall of man? Do you know that work is not from the curse? Did you know that? Right? This is, and, and, and just hear me. I love to play. I, I, I think I'm pretty good at playing. Um, I'm pretty good at enjoying things. But do you know that work is not bad? Uh, work honors the Lord, and 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 working to. Um, a lot of times we tell our kids to work hard, right? You need to go out and work hard. Why? It's not so you can get straight A's. It's not. You know the the ultimate goal of working hard is not to get into a great college and to get the highest paying job. Did you know that? Do you know why we work? Whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it with all your heart. Because you're serving the Lord. And he'll reward you. It, it, we, we've got to redefine work because if it's all just about our success, our accolades, our finances, right, that's not eternal. Um, this is one of the things I, 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 I sometimes ch I tell, challenge different ones on our staff because they end up doing all the work, and, and, and we, want, we want to be a hardworking staff because that honors the Lord. But sometimes I'm like, hey, don't feel bad about asking someone. We, we have a, a big volunteer culture, and I'm like, don't feel bad because here's why. If you don't challenge the church to work, you don't conform people into the image of Jesus. Why? Because Jesus is a servant. 
Jesus was a hard worker. The Bible says the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve. If you don't challenge people to serve, you don't let people become like Jesus. So when we're not working, when we're not serving, so this this tent thing, this took a lot of work. This took hours. There was several, uh, there's about half a dozen men that I just want to thank that rebuilt this stage, right? But when they're doing that, it's, they're honoring Jesus. Our, our amazing children's workers, it's not just about taking care of kids, it's, it is worship to Jesus. When you are taking care of your neighbors in the name of Jesus, you are honoring the Lord. Right? It is, it is worship to work unto the Lord. And when you do that, you become conformed into his image. I want to challenge you. How are you going to serve the Lord this year? If you're taking notes, write it down. How am I, how am I serving the Lord? That is worship. That is worship, just like raising your hand. I am all about coming and raising my hands in worship. But when you are are giving out a cup of cold water, when you are parking people in the parking lot, when you are taking something to someone who is sick, that is honor, that is worship, and that is becoming conformed into the image of Jesus. And it scares me, and I think the Lord is pruning. It scares me how much the American church was just about entertainment. Sit back, relax, and enjoy the show. It was like a movie, right? It's kind of like a, a flight versus, no, the church is an army becoming more and more like Jesus as we serve. Honest and vulnerable. Honest and vulnerable. Oh, this is, this is a big deal. Uh, because the world, you know, sometimes I'll ask non-Christians, What's the first word you think of when you think of, of Christians? This is, this is heartbreaking. They'll say hypocrite. Why? Because you're trying to act one way but live in a completely different way. The, the, the world is desperate for authentic. The world is desperate for real. Let me just say in this church we want to be real. I, I, I had a pastor that was bragging on you guys the other day. Well, I was talking to him about our freedom day. So, you know, in our 5Ds decision, Dunk Delivered, we, we believe that Jesus wants to set us free from our addictions. You know, they, they, they say that 80% of men are addicted to pornography. And I can just say, by God's grace, not in this church. But it's not because people didn't start that way in this church. It's because people got real that they had an addiction, and so they got set free. So I was talking to him about our Freedom Day, and I said, like, we've had about 800 people, 800 adults go through our Freedom Day. And he goes, man, uh, I could never get people to go to a Freedom Day in our church because they wouldn't admit they need freedom. He was like, how did you get your church to, 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 to admit they were free? And we said, well, from the very beginning, we've said this. We want to get rocked by God. We want to get real. It's in our vision statement. Get rocked. Get real. Give it away, right? This is a no phony zone, right? We're going we're gonna to be real. In fact, that's how we try to be in our preaching, Right? We, we try to not just come and impress. We actually share what's going on in our lives. And sometimes I get off the stage and I have a vulnerability hangover. I go, oh my gosh, I can't believe I told y'all that about me. But, but why? It's because we want to be real. Right? Because Jesus helps us in our weakness. The Bible says that God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. If you, oh, and there is no feeling. Now, I talk about a vulnerability hangover, and you're like, who would want one of those? But let me tell you, it might last for a moment, but there is nothing like knowing that there's no skeletons in the closet. There is nothing more free than, than, than getting things out in the open and knowing that you're not living a double life. There, there is nothing worse for a Christian to act one way and live another. But when you can just be free, and when you're real, you come down to the altar and you share what's going on. You're like, I can't believe it. I'm gonna say this. And people always say like, you're not gonna believe this. And we're like, we're gonna believe it. We've heard everything. (laughs) We've probably been through most of what you're about to say. And you unload that. The Bible says this, confess your sins one another and then you'll be healed. You wanna get free. And one of the things we get most free from is the the condemnation and the shame. But you can't get free from it until you've unloaded it. So just be real, right? 
and, and, and watch God just bring the release. You're real, and then he just releases you from that condemnation and, and that shame. Hospitable and warm. Now, I, I love this one. Share with the Lord's people who are in need. Practice hospitality. Yeah, everyone would love to have friends. Everyone would love to, 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 to have, have a friend. You know the people that I find that, that have more friends than they know what to do with? They're hospitable people. They're hospitable. They're the ones that, that are gracious with others. And, and you think, well, I'd, I'd be hospitable if I had more money. You know, I, I, that's, that's just not the case. I, I've met some of the most hospitable people I know are some of the poorest people I know. Man, I've had the privilege of, of traveling to third world countries where we're going into dirt floor, little shacks, and they're pulling out everything and serving. And man, I am just humbled by the generosity. I, I, it, it does not depend on your economic station how hospitable you are. It depends on the economics of your heart. It's not how, how big your, 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 your bank account is, it's how big your heart is. And, I just, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm preaching to myself because I, I wanna grow in this. I wanna grow in, in, in being hospitable. I wanna grow in relational warmth that when people come, I'm, man, I'm, be, be gen, and, and this isn't just generosity financially, although that's a big one. I mean, um, people just, it's, it's amazing how touched people are when you buy them a meal. It's amazing, or buy, and you say, I can't even afford a meal. Buy, buy someone a cup of coffee. It's amazing how touched someone is. But also be generous with eye contact. Be generous with your time. I, I, I love that our, our, our church lingers, and you don't just run out of here after the service. Be generous with your time. Be generous with your ear, with your listening, right? Uh, there, there's numerous people that come in to this church, and they live all alone, and this is, the, this is their moment of family, and you might be the one person who gives them the gift of family by just asking them how they're just sitting and listening. And that means the world to people. Be generous with your words. Be warm with your words. Just a smile. Be, be, be a smiling person. I, I actually practice smiling. Like I'll be driving my car and I'll be all down. I'll be like, why? Because I, I, I realize the gift it is when, when we smile at someone. We're just, I, have you done that? Have you been through just you're, you're going, you're checking out at the cash register and someone smiles at you and you're like, thank you. Thank, because, why? Because people, people matter, right? They're not just a means to an end. Treat each person as a valuable person. Let's end with this, healthy conflict. Healthy kind. And let me just say with the hospitality, one of the, the most powerful things you can do, um, and, and because this is a, a church of small groups. We believe that people actually get transformed when we get together in smaller groups. One of the greatest things you can do is open your, your home or your apartment or your dorm room. That, that transforms people. I mean, we, we, we have found that that was our, our dining room table was our greatest evangelism tool when we started this church. Just sitting around the table and, and having meals and sharing meals. That is something that you can do. You don't have to have the, I, I have been in opulent homes that felt cold. And I've been in the tiniest homes where I didn't want to leave because of the warmth of Jesus was there. And I felt loved. Okay, let's finish with this healthy conflict. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse I think more and more this is going to be one of the delineators of healthy Christian community is can we actually have conflict and still love each other? Do you know in, in this church, do you know that we don't all agree with each other on every topic? Did you know, did you know that? I could start bringing up topics, but I'm, I'm not going to because um, I don't want your blood pressure to rise. I want, I want to end this sermon peacefully. But uh, there are a lot of things we don't, Agree on, but the difference between the church and the world is you can disagree and find unity. You can disagree and still love each other. And in fact, iron sharpens iron. And so you don't need to just brush things off. We actually need to go to each other. I was, I was at a, uh, a, a little 
football luncheon yesterday, and I loved my, our, our coach and his wife are, are, are strong believers. And I, I, I love that she said there was a guy in the, in the stands who was just tearing into her husband, who's the football coach. And so she turned around and she said, do you know that that's my husband and you're insulting him and that's hurtful to me? Can you imagine just in the stands? And so after the game, the guy just beelines it for the coach. And he's like, I need to talk to you. And he goes, yes, you do. And the guy looks at him and says, I'm so ashamed of myself. I am so sorry for what I was saying. And I don't want to be that way. The guy was, was a doctor. He ended up like serving numerous people in the football community with his doctor's skills, and they became close friends. Can, can I tell you that conflict done right brings intimacy and brings growth and brings a deeper unity? Uh, sometimes young couples come up to me and say, like, we've never had a fight. Our, our relationship is so amazing. And I go, uh-oh. You know, they're thinking they're going to impress me. And I'm like, that's um, no two humans agree on everything. And so I want to use being fake. Um, but if you, can, if you can have a fight and make up, then you're actually becoming mature. And you're actually learning to treat someone with the values of Jesus. And conflict, when you work through it, actually brings deeper uni unity and intimacy and a greater security because someone knows I don't just have to agree with everything you say for you to like me. Do you understand what I'm saying? We are living in a world where the second we confront someone or the second there's, there's conflict, people peace out and they start ghosting each other. But the church is the place where we can actually conflict, where we can confront in love and then we actually say, I'm committed to you. And then the next week we show up and you're blown away that you actually got in an argument, but you actually are still together. And that's what the world needs more than ever. I actually believe that people are going to be saved through healthy conflict. I believe that people are going to be healed through healthy conflict. People were, were, are beaten and abused and hurt by other people. But when there's actually healthy conflict in love, it heals hearts, and it restores relationship, and it brings growth and, and, and Christian blessing and love. I'm out of time. Why don't we stand up?